Good afternoon. My name is Christina Mora, and I have the distinct pleasure of directing the Institute of Governmental Studies alongside my colleague, Eric Schickler. I want to welcome you here and thank you for attending the first of our IGS Breaking News panels. Events like this allow us to showcase our IGS poll findings and provide you with the very first look at some of the most important trends in California today. Now, IGS was founded 100 years ago, and I can speak for Eric as well when I say that we are honored to carry out the good work of directors past and look forward to shepherding the Institute into its next phase, especially at a moment when state-of-the-art research and civil debate seem more critical than ever. We look forward to more events like this, which celebrate the contributions of IGS research and provide a chance for us to get to know you, our broader IGS community, better. So now with further ado, I'd like to introduce IGS's new executive director, Christine Trost. Christine has only been in her position a few months, but already her energy and her commitment has made an invaluable mark on all of us. She will be moderating our panel this evening. So please join me in welcoming Christine onto stage. Thank you, Christina, and welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming out on this afternoon. I'm delighted uh, that you are here. I'm also delighted to host our first of what will probably be many breaking news panels. While impeachment is not exactly breaking news, um, we are really thrilled to bring together a panel of experts to help us make sense of what is happening today at this critical moment in American politics, um, to understand the views of California voters in particular on this important issue of impeachment, uh, to understand the historical and political context and forces that are driving um, what is likely to be the third presidential impeachment in American history as well as to understand the strategic considerations and calculations that are being made by our two political parties, and to understand what all of this means for us, for the American people, for our political institutions that we love and need, and um, for representative democracy in the United States in 2019. As um, Christina said, we're going to be holding more of these panels, and if you are not already on our mailing list, please consider joining. The um, information is on the screen, and that way you'll receive our upcoming announcements of, uh, of future panels like this. Um, before I begin, I want to thank the IGS and Matsui staff for helping to organize this event, um, and especially thank uh, Sonia Moctezuma and Kelly Jones and Alexandria Wright. The format for this event is going to be for me to, inter to introduce the, all of our three panelists um, right now so that I don't interrupt the flow of their presentations. Uh, but afterwards, after they've all presented, we're going to join each other on the stage here, and then we will take your questions. So we really want this to be an opportunity for you to have your questions answered uh, during this uh, critical time. And we invite you to fill out a note card or write your question on a piece of paper and hand it down to the aisle, and our staff will come through and pick them up and bring them up to the, um, to the stage, and we'll, we'll read them off. Um, if you need a note card, just raise your hand and we will get you one. So it's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Our first speaker will be Mark DiCamillo. Mark is director of the Berkeley IGS Poll, which is a nonpartisan survey of California public opinion on matters of politics, public policy, and public affairs. He has been actively involved in measuring public opinion in California since 1978, when he worked uh, at the Field Research Corporation, founded by the legendary pollster Mark Mervyn Field. He worked under Mr. Field as assistant director of the statewide field poll for 15 years, and in 1993 succeeded Field to become its director and served in that capacity until 2016. During his tenure, the field poll consistently was ranked 
among the nation's most accurate and reliable polls in Nate Silver's 538.com's biennial evaluation of major polling organizations across the United States. He is a recognized authority on polling in California and is the author of hundreds of reports summarizing California public opinion. He's also cum laude graduate of Harvard University and holds a master's in business administration from Cornell University's Johnson School of Business. Our second speaker will be Katie Merrill. Katie is founder and president of the Merrill Strategy Group, which is a California-based political consulting firm. She began her career as a grassroots organizer for Senator Barbara Boxer, uh, during her groundbreaking U.S. Senate campaign in 1992. Katie then managed Congresswoman Ellen Tauscher's first campaign in 1996, winning a dramatic upset over a Republican incumbent. After the campaign, she joined Representative Tauscher on Capitol Hill as her chief of staff, managing her Washington and California operations until 1999. In 2000, she ran the day-to-day -day statewide campaign as the California director, for Bill Bradley for president. And while working at Kaufman Campaign Consultants, she played a key role in the successful No on 38, No on School Vouchers initiative campaign in California. Since then, she has worked on over a dozen statewide initiative campaigns in California, including serving in 2012 as general consultant for Vote Yes on Proposition 35 which was the Stop Human Trafficking in California initiative. It won the highest vote share of any statewide ballot initiative in California history. She oversaw in 2010 the successful statewide field campaign against Prop 23, the Dirty Energy Initiative, which would have suspended California state law requiring reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, and worked on 2012 Yes on 39, Close the Corporate Tax Loophole Initiative with now presidential candidate Tom Steyer. Over the course of her 25-year career, she has advised Democratic campaigns for president, governor, U.S. Senate and House representatives, state legislative candidates, statewide initiative campaigns, Democratic organizations, and environmental, labor, and other public advocacy groups. Most recently, she was a senior strategist for Eleni Kunalakis' successful bid for lieutenant governor and controller Betty Yee's re-election in 2018. She's a graduate of Amherst College. Our third speaker will be Eric Schickler. Eric is Jeffrey and Ashley McDermott Professor of Political Science here at UC Berkeley. He is the author of numerous award-winning books, including Disjointed Pluralism, Institutional Innovation, and the Development of U.S. Congress, Filibuster, Obstruction and Lawmaking in the United States Senate, Investigating the President, Congressional Checks on Presidential Power, and Racial Realignment, the Transformation of American Liberalism, 1932 to 1965. In addition to these and other books, he has authored or co-authored articles that have appeared in the top academic journals in the fields of political science and comparative political studies and social science history as well. His research and teaching interests are in the areas of American politics, U.S. Congress, rational choice theory, American political development, and public opinion. And in July of this year, as Christina mentioned, he was appointed interim co-director of IGS, along with Christina. Um, and I am delighted to introduce all three of you and to have you speak at this event. And with that, I'll invite Mark up to begin your presentation. It's a pleasure to be here and to actually be at uh, IGS. I've been here now for about three years, and it's really been a pleasure for me to be to land here after Field was kind of disbanded in 2016. Okay, um, great. Um, I, I wanted to say that you know we did this poll with this event in mind, in the sense that we knew we would want to do a speaking engagement about the uh, issue of impeachment. Uh, we included the questions on the late November poll, and we actually chose the timing of the poll mainly because it came directly after the last Democratic presidential debate, which we were also covering, you know, the election politics in California, but it also ended up being the exact day in which the televised hearings had concluded. So we were entering the field and gaining public opinion right at the time of the conclusion of these very, you know, well-orchestrated televised debates uh, at the national level, and uh, 
I wanted to see well, what, what effect will the debate, the uh, impeachment panel have, and I'll be able to answer that as we get a little further down the line. Okay, a little about the poll. We do our polls uh, under the auspices of IGS. Uh, the dates were the 21st through the 27th of November, right before Thanksgiving as well. Uh, we ended up with a sample of 3,482 registered voters, and these are all collected online by distributing email invitations to random samples of registered voters across the state. Um, the uh, results are weighted at the end of the line to make sure that all of the demographics of the registered voter sample are in line with known characteristics of the state's registered voters. Okay, the first question in the impeachment series uh, was basically, what do California registered voters think about the decision of the House to conduct an impeachment inquiry into President Trump? And here you can see uh, very overwhelming support. Uh, 65% of California voters approved of that decision, most of them strongly, 52%, 35% uh, disapproved. And as you can look at the party identification numbers, and you'll see these again and again on my slides, just interpret them as the percentages for each group. The Democrats broke 95 to 5, approved to disapprove. The Republicans, 9 to 91. So polar opposites in their views on this question. The independents will be the interesting segment as we walk through this. Uh, they broke about even on the first question. How closely are California voters uh, saying they're following the impeachment inquiry, again, right after the conclusion of the televised uh, uh, inquiry? 42% of voters said they were following it very closely, 40% somewhat closely, 18% not closely at all. And you can see that there are big differences uh, depending on the party affiliation of voters. And let me just describe, when we say independence, we are not including the leaners to either party. The Democrats include both the, the partisans who say that I'm a Democrat, and then if they say initially independent and say they lean to the Democratic Party, they're included as Democrats. So the independents are pure independents, and they're only about 13% or so of the state's registered voters, but they're a significant group, as you'll see. On the question of following the impeachment investigation, much lower proportion of them were following it very closely. Okay. The next question had to do with the perceived fairness of the House impeachment inquiry into President Trump's dealings with the Ukraine government, which was the subject of most of that two-week period. Um, the vote here, again, was highly partisan. 50% overall said thought they were fair and impartial. 32% thought they were unfair and too partisan. 18% had no opinion. Uh, but look at the differences uh, by party, uh, certainly polar opposites there, but independents more likely to say that they were too partisan and unfair. Again, they're not paying that close attention either. Keep that in mind. <laughs> California's registered voters were then asked, how should the House of Representatives vote on impeaching uh, President Trump? 57% uh, of the state's registered voters said that they supported uh, the House voting yes to impeach the president. 30% uh, wanted to, uh, their, uh, them to vote no. 13% said they weren't sure or it was too soon to say. They wanted to hear more information. Partisan split, again, mirror images of one another. Democrats 85 to 3, Republicans 8 to 81. Uh, but independents on the fence. 40 to 36, with well, the remainder, 24%, were saying it's too soon to say or they weren't sure. Okay, what would, should the Senate do uh, if the House does vote to impeach? Um, here we find that 55%, very similar proportion, thought they should vote to convict and remove Trump from office. 28% thought they should vote to acquit the president, uh, and it's a, a fair amount of people, 17%, thought it was too soon to say for uh, what the Senate should do on, on the vote. Uh, again, party identification, very clear divisions there. Independence on the fence, 36, 31, and then the remainder is, I believe, 32. So uh, a lot of them were saying it's too soon to say or they were just unsure. 
If we then combine the results from both the impeachment vote in the House with the impeachment vote in the Senate, what we find is that 50% of California's voters supported both. They, they wanted the House to impeach and they wanted the Senate to convict. A 7% proportion said they supported the House impeachment but either opposed or were uncertain about what the Senate should do. 39% were opposed or unsure about both, that uh, they were unsure about the House impeachment vote or unsure or opposed the Senate conviction and 4% were others. Now, who were the groups that were strongest in support of both uh, impeachment in the House and conviction in the Senate? Uh, as you can see, Democrats, uh, these are the party identifiers, 77%, uh, African Americans, 72%. Uh, voters with a, these are uh, all California registered voters with a postgraduate education, 61% in favor of both. Uh, the age segment that was highest in support was age 30 to 39. <coughs> No surprise, the Bay Area, the highest among the regions at 57% for both uh, House impeachment and conviction. Women, 56%. There is a gender gap on some of these questions. Uh, Asian American voters, 56% as well. This is an interesting question. We also asked voters uh, whether they felt the House should focus more on impeachment or more on other national issues. And again, this is California, but viewed from 3,000 miles away, the voting population would like other national issues to be attended to. Uh, I think that may actually be one of the reasons they're moving this impeachment vote up very quickly. At least that seems to be consistent with what this poll would suggest. Uh, voters are getting a little impatient. They don't want it more long and drawn out. They'd like the nation's business to be attended to. Um, Democrats, on the other hand, are more likely to say more attention to impeachment, 52 to 30. Republicans are nearly unanimous, thinking that uh, more attention should be paid to national issues. And they're joined by independents by about a four to one margin. They think uh, more attention should be paid to national issues. We also included the job uh, ratings for both the House Speaker and the House Intelligence Committee Chair Adam Schiff. Uh, this is the first time we've ever, I've ever seen a poll of Adam Schiff in the state of California. <laughs> we've, we've done uh, lots of polls on Nancy Pelosi. In fact, when she was House Speaker during her first tenure, the field poll regularly uh, asked Californians what they thought about the job performance rating of House Speaker Pelosi. And I have to say that those ratings were generally speaking more negative than positive. And that kind of followed along with the national public opinion as well. Californians had more, more of them were disapproving of the House Speaker in her first tenure, uh, and especially the last three or four measures that we did in the final year and a half. So for Nancy Pelosi now, and this is the first measure that I've, done, I've seen or that I've done on uh, her job approval rating in this tenure, she's now viewed positively. And this is, I think, a very significant finding. It's hard for a well-known political personality to change the opinions of voters from a negative to a positive. Very rarely done. But Nancy Pelosi has been able to pull that off this year. Uh, now we, she's getting 53% of the state's voters approving versus 46% disapproving. Adam Schiff, which is interesting, 75% of voters have an opinion one way or the other about Adam Schiff. This is tough to do for a congressman. Uh, and, you know, he's probably thinking, well, people know me now. That's probably a good thing. Uh, and these views, as you can imagine, are highly partisan, much more positive among the Democrats, much more negative among the Republicans. But his overall image rating is 44 approved, 31 disapproved. Now let's talk about the man who all of this is about. Uh, we have trend measures that date back to December of 2017, where we asked Trump's job performance ratings on a four-point scale. The question is, do you approve strongly, approve somewhat, disapprove somewhat, or disapprove strongly? We've repeated this question in each of the successive surveys, and look at the results. I mean, this is very difficult to do in public opinion research, replicating the same measure over and over and over again. There has been no change whatsoever that I can see 
in the job performance ratings of Donald Trump in California over this period. It started out at 66% negative uh, to 30% positive in December of 2017. It's now 68 to 32. Even if you look at the, the darker shaded uh, colors, that's the proportion who strongly hold to their views. So that even the proportions who strongly disapprove have remained very stable, as has the proportion who strongly approve. Very little movement. So what is the end result of the House impeachment hearings on California public opinion? Negligible. And just to get confirmation of that, we do have a second measure that we asked, and we started that measure this year. It asks California likely voters, these are likely voters in the upcoming November general election, just a generic question, how likely are you to vote to reelect Donald Trump for president? There's no uh, Democratic challenger named, it's just him on his own. And what you find is that absolutely no change in these measures either. Uh, starting in June, it was 66, 31 in California. They're not inclined to uh, reelect the president. It's 67 to 30 in our current measure. Uh, that 37% gap, by the way, 37 percentage point gap, uh, compares to the election outcome in California in 2016, which was 30%. So if people follow through on just their general inclination, it'll be an even more historic wipeout uh, of, of President Trump here in California. I don't think there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, polling done on, on in California with, with much drama about who's going to win the presidential election here. Thank you very much. The independents, again, it's a small sliver, but they are 58% not inclined to 30 inclined, so two to one on the negative side as we're starting out. Uh, that's from the latest poll. So that does show that they're more inclined to be on the Democrat, with, along with the Democrats on this, almost every Democrat is not inclined to, to reelect the president. But uh, if you look at the independents on this, um, it's not looking good for the president. One other thing about independents generally, and this actually has more to do with no party preference voters, which is how you register as an independent in California. By and large, those voters tend to mirror the overall percentages statewide. I've found that again and again on questions uh, on politics usually the independents are closer to the statewide average uh, than either of the parties, which are obviously one way or the other. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, I'm Katie Merrill. I have no PowerPoint for today. Um, uh, what I want to talk to you about a little bit is the impact of impeachment on House races, Senate races, and a little bit on, on the presidential race. So full disclosure, I am working on Tom Steyer's campaign for president. So just know that that is what I am doing as I talk about uh, uh, the presidential races. So um, First of all, I would just as a point of trivia, because we are in historical times, although history seems to be repeating itself every 20 plus years or so, uh, I uh, was working as chief of staff for the late Congresswoman Ellen Tauscher on the Hill in December, in fact, on December 10th of 1998. And um, I remember much about day-to-day, uh, -day, uh, about the impeachment process, but I did want to read to you from the Washington Post the headline uh, from Thursday, December 10th, 1998, Republicans draft four impeachment articles on Clinton. And it says, unmoved by the White House defense case, just note the similarities. Of course, in this case, the White House hasn't really made a defense. The Republican majority on the House Judiciary Committee yesterday proposed four articles of impeachment alleging that President Clinton has betrayed his trust as president and has acted in a manner subversive of the rule of law and justice. The articles, modeled on the language that panel used 24 years earlier in Watergate, charged Clinton with obstruction of justice, abuse of power, 
and two counts of perjury stemming from the, his attempts to cover up his affair with Monica Lewinsky. So um, history repeats itself, I would say. Um, so uh, one of the things that uh, Congresswoman Tauscher and I uh, did last cycle, uh, she was former Congresswoman at that point, she had retired uh, in 2009, gone to the State Department, negotiated the New START Treaty, um, left the State Department in 2012 and, and left politics uh, in an official capacity then, but she and I had continued to work together since, since 96. And when, uh, when 2016 happened uh, and Hillary Clinton had won a number of Republican seats in the House, we in particular looked at those seats in California three of which were new and they were all in Orange County. They were suburban Orange County seats. And we both said to each other, those are districts that we know. They are just like her district was in 96, east of here uh, on the other side of the Caldecott Tunnel um, when she won that seat and beat a Republican. And it was the last Republican seat left uh, in the Bay Area. Um, and so we started a super PAC called Fight Back California. And what we did in 2018 was a series of polls and research in all seven of these districts, and in fact, we, f we threw in the Nunez district for kicks, uh, um, and don't you wanna do that again? Um, uh, uh, so, so we did research in, in eight districts and, 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 and were active in these districts last year. Um, so here's what we found. Uh, and, and basically, I'm going to say what Mark said with different proof points. Um, we found that in every one of those districts, Donald Trump was underwater, as we say, in his approval ratings, anywhere from 55 disapproval uh, to 45 approval um, to, you know, something a little closer. But in, he was upside down in every one of those districts. We actually asked impeachment questions in 2017. And we gave people uh, three choices. Democrats should uh, work with Donald Trump to you know, uh, move legislation forward that betters the nation, one option. Another option, um, Democrats should stand up to Donald Trump and resist his, uh, his efforts at every turn. Third option, Donald Trump is a threat should, and he should be impeached and removed from office. And we asked that question starting in June of 2017. We asked it again in March of 2018. We asked it again in October of 2018. And in every one of those districts, he, the, the, uh, the preferred option was to impeach and remove from office, even in these swing districts. But it was a much closer margin than his approval disapproval. So if he was, there was a, if he was, uh, disapproved by 10 points more than he was approved. People wanted him impeached 51-49, 52-48, uh, but, but they still preferred that option. Um, and then, uh, so what we were seeing was in most of these cases, uh, and this was true across the nation in these congressional seats, they were sort of divided into two uh, categories uh, in terms of why they were trending Democratic, why they would have voted for Hillary Clinton but, but elected a Republican to go back to Congress. Either because suburban, Republican, and independent women were voting Democratic at the top of the ticket, or because there was a growing a Latino population uh, and, and often an, a growing API population in those districts that were trending them Democratic. And so what we saw was those very groups that were tending Democratic were the ones that were saying, obviously uh, were responsible for the upside down approval ratings, but they were also the ones that were leaning towards impeachment as far back as 2017. We recently did a poll, uh, which in, in a swing district here, so now we have these seven new incumbents, but these districts are still competitive except for perhaps California 49, but don't tell Mike Levin. Um, and uh, so we recently did a poll in one of those districts, and what did we find? Trump's approval ratings, he's underwater, 
eight points, 10 points. We asked about impeachment. Now that impeachment is real, we asked about this last week, the exact same result, 51-49. Nothing's changed. So why is that? Well, let me, before I go there, let me just talk about the Senate races. So what did we see happen in 2018 with the Senate races? We saw massive momentum towards Democrats in the House. Democrats win all of these swing seats. We take back the House. What happens in the Senate races? We lose some seats. We lost Claire McCaskill. We lost Joe Donnelly in Indiana. Uh, we picked up Doug Jones in the special. That was, that was you know, he was running against a sexual predator. Um, who, if you may or may not remember that special election. Um, so, but, but we had the opposite impact, effect, opposite results in the Senate races. So what Trump, what Trump knew by three months before the election in 2018 is he was going to lose the House, so he had to do everything he could to keep the Senate. And so he went to all the key states two times, three times, maybe even four times. I know he was in Montana at least three times in the last six to eight weeks of the election. He actually was not able to flip that seat, and John Tester kept it. But doing what he could to turn out his base, because these are the elections we run now, in order to defeat the Claire McCaskills and Joe Donnellys of the world and, uh, and keep the seats he needed to keep. So as much as uh, Trump's um, uh, approval ratings and performance and popularity helped Democrats in the House seats, um, and, the, and the Kavanaugh effect, which we did a bunch of research on and found that the Kavanaugh effect was positive for Democrats in the swing seats and negative for Democrats in the Senate seats. So here we are today, people, Democrats are very focused on trying to win back the Senate. In my opinion, to the detriment of keeping the House, makes me very nervous. Um, and, uh, and we only need four seats. I think it's four seats to tie, because then, and then uh, hopefully if, we get, if the Democrats get the presidential seat, then they have the tiebreaker vote with the vice president. I think it's five seats to win. I could be off by one there. But what's happening in those seats, so where are those? That's Maine, Susan Collins. Uh, that's Tillis in North Carolina. Um, there's the two seats that are up in Georgia. Uh, both are Republican. The special, we probably won't win we have more chance of winning the, the regular full term, but still a long shot. Um, you've got Cornyn in Texas. Um, uh, you've got Cory Gardner in, uh, in Colorado. So there's a number of, uh, you've got Joni, Joni Ernst, who's vulnerable in Iowa. There's a number of these Senate seats that are up, but the same effect is happening, which is these are Republican states where Trump is popular and the impeachment is working against Democrats there. Um, and so we sort of have a similar kind of set of dynamics that are working against each other, House and in terms of the House and Senate, uh, to what was happening in 2018. And then you get to the presidential race, where in fact, I don't think impeachment is really going to impact the presidential race because the presidential race is between Donald Trump and a particular Democrat, whoever that might be. So that becomes uh, uh, a choice, a specific choice between voters, uh, for voters between these two candidates. The only issue is whether uh, in places like the Florida Panhandle, um, in places like uh, northern Wisconsin and the Iron Range in Minnesota, um, rural parts of Iowa, do those Republican voters turn out in droves because of the impeachment inquiry um, uh, that is going on right now. And, and is that an overperformance over 2016, which would take a lot because those Republicans really overperformed in 2016 because of their uh, uh, deep, deep, visceral dislike of the Democratic candidate. So, um, so uh, the question is sort of why is everything in stasis? Why, is this, why are the same dynamics in play in 20, 2019, 2020 that were in play in 2017, 2018, um, now that we're actually in impeachment? Why hasn't that moved anything? 
Now, my theory is because the, um, and I'm a Democrat, so I speak in a partisan way, as much as I like to analyze thing, things. The awfulness of this president, this presidency, uh, this reality TV presidency that has broken every norm that we've known in our lifetimes, that makes Richard Nixon look like a Boy Scout, that, um, uh, that is, that is uh, just demonstrating criminality and venality every single day uh, has been embodied in this guy as a reality TV show celebrity for 30 years. We've all known this about him for decades. He's just doing it from the White House now. People knew what they were buying when they went and laid their money down for this president uh, in 2016. So the people who are with him are still with him. The people who were never with him are never gonna be with him. And then we've got these 13% of independents in California and probably similarly, similar small amount across the country that on the margins are moving slightly, um, but not much. So we're gonna come down to another race uh, in 2020. You know, most likely he gets impeached in the House, he gets acquitted in the Senate, we move into the presidential campaign, and, and we come down to exactly the same race we had in 2016, which means it will be inches, you know, Woody Hayes used to say three inches in a cloud of dust, right? That's what we're talking about, those kind of slight margins um, one way or another, or another uh, in terms of who's gonna actually end up winning in 2020. Um, and impeachment will have had, I think, probably marginal effect on the entire uh, outcome. So, that's me. <laughs> First, want to thank Mark and, and, and Katie for, for their great comments, which I'm going to build off of. And I also just want to take a moment to thank uh, the IGS staff Again, uh, echoing Christine and Christina for all their great work putting this event together. So I'd like to say that uh, my comments offer, I wish I could say my comments will offer a more optimistic take on the meaning of this impeachment battle, but I, um, I honestly cannot do that. So I'm going to offer you hopefully a take that puts in historical perspective and a little bit of theoretical or institutional perspective some of the reasons behind uh, what Mark and Katie were talking about, and then also think about the implications. The biggest thing I want to talk about really is to think about the implications of this impeachment battle for what it says about the robustness of our democratic institutions in the United States. And yeah, I see a couple of my uh, Poli Sci 103 Congress students with apologies for saying some of the same kinds of things that they've been listening to for several months. Uh, <laughs> So I actually start out actually uh, really all of my American politics courses here at Berkeley with, uh, with the, thinking about the question of what it takes to sustain the United States as a stable republic. And we go back to Madison and, and the founding, not because they were necessarily right in a lot of their predictions, but because the analysis they offered, I think, offers a really useful lens to think about these questions. In particular, Madison in the Federalist Papers famously puts a lot of reliance on institutions to maintain a system of stability, where we create the separation of powers. We have three separate branches. And then we provide checks and balances, giving each branch kinds of mechanisms to check one another. And the claim is that what that does is prevent any one branch from becoming a tyrant and from abusing its power. And Madison notes in, in the Federalist Papers that it's not enough just to write down and have these three separate institutions. You have to build in kind of pr protections for the stability of the system. So what he talks about is giving each branch both the constitutional means and the personal motives to defend the power of their own branch. And so what Madison talks about is the a ambition must be made to counteract ambition. Right? And so I want to use that as a kind of lens to think about this. Um, as we talk about, about impeachment today, both in terms of means and then in terms of motivation. All right, so if you think about Congress's means to fight presidential abuses, there are really three kinds of categories. First is legislation. 
The president does something that oversteps the president's authority. Well, you can try to pass a law to reverse that. But obviously, legislation faces a veto problem. The president has the power to use the veto to stop legislation. And then you need two thirds majorities in both chambers to override that veto. So that's going to be a really limited kind of check in practice, a limited means it's turned out historically. Another option is investigations. Congress, from the founding, has, has asserted the authority to exert oversight over the executive branch and to call in executive officers to testify about what their actions are, to defend themselves, and answer questions from members of Congress. And you can think of this, again, as another check, a way if, if, if the president or the president's administration is misbehaving, you can call them to account, force them to face Congress, and then through that, the people. And one of the findings that uh, I've done some work on investigations with Doug Kreiner in this, uh, where we, one of the things we find is that intense investigative activity historically has had a real impact on president's approval ratings, bringing them down, and on policy in the long term, shaping, forcing presidents to kind of adapt due to public pressure that gets raised. So investigations are an important tool under the Constitution. But while investigations can be effective, they can also face stonewalling. And there's a long tradition of presidents trying to resist these investigations by claiming, for example, executive privilege. Um, historically, though, when presidents have claimed executive privilege, uh, first of all, the claims have been limited in scope. They've tried to protect particular aspects of their deliberations, but not wholesale stop Congress from asserting oversight. And, uh, and they've typically ended up being resolved through kinds of informal negotiations where the president at least gives some ground. Trump administration is really exceptional in this regard in making a blanket claim of executive privilege, refusing to systematically turn over essentially any documents and allow and, and is essentially refusing for any of their officials, though we have had some essentially against their instructions now testify, but basically blocking testimony from a whole range, much wider range of officials. So then, so then this in turn makes investigations a much less effective kind of tool if you can't gather this information, right? So then the third, what's the third constitutional means? Well, that's impeachment, right? That impeachment is the ultimate club when all other mechanisms are failing institutionally. And that actually makes understanding impeachment, I think, really central. It's a rarely used or should be a rarely used power. But if you think about ultimately what's going to deter presidents from extreme forms of misbehavior, there really are two things. One is impeachment, and the second is elections in the end, in the final analysis. Um, so that makes understanding how impeachment works really important. So that's in terms of means. I want to make the case that. This is really important. And so the potential breakdown in this process is really important, as we'll see. All right, so that's means. What about motivation? Well, I think, and this is, I think, actually, if you think about what the framers got wrong, like if you think, what did they misunderstand fundamentally or miss? I think the most important thing that they missed is that they didn't account for the role of political parties. They saw parties as a possibility, but their hope was that they would avoid the creation of political parties. That was, that was the goal. And in that context, you could imagine members of Congress having their institutional interest. As a member of Congress, your stake is in Congress and its power being really important. And so when Congress's power is threatened, members will defend that power. But what happens when you have party in as a rival motivation is party can essentially out, you know, trump, pardon the, the uh, play on words, trump institutional motivations. And so, as we see now with, with Republican politicians uh, in terms of defense of Trump, uh, we see, I think, a quite their partisan interests really leading them to not worry about congressional power in the way that the founders expected them to do. Uh, and then related to those are also electoral motivations. Uh, that, I think, the founders did anticipate, but I think that but missing the role of party led them to not understand how well, if you're, if you're running for Congress as a partisan, and especially in the current era when you're relying on a primary electorate to return you to office, if Republican voters, for example, are demanding that you defend the president, that's going to make it very hard for these members to, to worry at all about the evidence one way or another in an impeachment trial. All right. So 
so this is suggesting that the, while the means exist, the motivation may, may not. And, I, I wanna, and in thinking about this, what's I think also really important to note is this is actually something different. So par party has always been here. The founders turned out to be wrong, and they found out they were wrong very quickly within their own lives, lifetimes. But throughout our history, party has been one of several motivations for members of Congress. And so there are times when other motivations, including the institutional one, ended up playing the key role. We're now in an era in which party ends up playing a kind of dominant role, and that's shaping how impeachment is playing out today as compared to the past. And so just to give you a you know, quick summary of what's been going on, though you all, I think, are familiar with it, um, you know, the House vote to launch the inquiry, all Republicans opposed, all but two Democrats in favor, the House Intelligent vote, Intelligence Committee vote on the report, a perfect party line vote, um, and I think everybody's expecting that the vote on the impeachment articles will have all Republicans opposed uh, and probably all but a small handful of Democrats in favor. And I ask, I want to pose a couple of thought experiments to you, or first a thought experiment, and, and that is, um, can you imagine, is there any evidence that one could possibly imagine emerging that would lead a significant number of Republicans to vote to impeach the president? Right? Like I thought, like what would it take? What would have to happen to lead a significant number to do so? And I think that the, the answer is it's, it's hard to imagine like what that would be, you know? And, and that's really different, right? And I want to contrast that to the Watergate case in particular. You think about Watergate. Watergate was partisan too. There was partisanship mattered in Watergate. Yeah, uh, but it didn't play quite the same role that, it, that it's playing today. Uh, and so, um, and, and there are two sides of it, actually. First of all, it's worth noting, among Democrats, there were a lot of Southern Democrats that were skeptical of taking on President Nixon at the start. And there are a lot of Southern Democrats in Congress in important roles, roles in this period. And they had to be brought along to the idea that impeachment was justified. At the same time, there are a lot of Republicans who are inclined to defend the president. But what we saw in Watergate was a responsiveness to events that, we, that Mark's data and Katie's discussion shows just is not happening today. So a kind of key moment in Watergate is when Nixon in October 73 orders the firing of special prosecutor Archibald Cox, right? And this is the famous Saturday Night Massacre where uh, initially Elliot Richardson, the attorney general, refuses to fire Archibald Cox, so he resigns. Nixon uh, asks Ruckle, uh, William Ruckel's house, his deputy, to fire. He orders him to fire Archibald Cox. He refuses and resigns. And then finally, Robert Bork, the third in line, agrees to fire Archibald Cox. Now, what's noteworthy about that is once Nixon did this, you get prominent Republican senators, in particular Ed Brooke of Massachusetts and Charles Percy of Illinois, who soon after call on Nixon to resign. Right? So they are looking at these events and are sufficiently troubled by them that they call on Nixon to, to leave office. And in the end, one third of Judiciary Committee Republicans voted for impeachment articles against Nixon. Right? Where start out, none would have been in favor. But at, by the end, one third. And, and I think what's, a, what's important to note is you know, that still is partisan. You, know, you have all the Democrats on one side and two thirds of the Repo Republicans on the other. But if you're an ordinary voter looking out at this and you see some prominent Republicans like Percy and Brooke, and you see a bunch of House Republicans as well voting against the president, that sends a message to you. Hey, maybe this isn't purely about party, right? Maybe something else is going on and that in turn will lead voters to update their views. All right, so here's a contrast to the stability we see here. Right, I said, so here's Nixon and Trump approval by voter partisanship during the Watergate era. Notice um, red line is Republicans, the middle line is independents, blue line is Democrats. Notice Nixon starts out looking quite a bit like Trump among Republicans, support in the 80s, right? And he's never popular among Democrats, but he does have about half of Democrats in support at the start. And then look what happens as, as Watergate, oh, sh uh, do I? Not used to, there we go. Look what happens as the hearings start. This is, he's reelected in 72, massive landslide. And then look at this decline among Republicans, independents, and Democrats. 
as Watergate's un unfolding, a gradual erosion in presidential support that in turn is allowing or leading these Republicans to take on the president as well in Congress, right? Um, contrast that to Donald Trump. This is the same story that we got from Mark. This is just with national data, uh, 2019 job approval. Here's the Republican line, perfectly stable. Independents, perfectly stable. Democrats, perfectly stable, right? Not, and so that, um, so the events just aren't moving the public, um, and, and as a result, that's going to affect the incentives for elites, for political leaders. All right. Why, is, why are things so different? Um, and this is a cottage industry. Political scientists have spent a lot of time trying to understand this. I'm just going to very briefly say a couple things about it. One is that, that a big change is that partisanship is now linked to other social identities that people have in a much stronger, tighter way. Race, gender, ideology, region, um, core attitudes that have had religiosity that existed in part in the past kind of cross-cut party, now we're all aligned with it. And you can think of partisanship in the words of Liliana Mason, a political scientist, is now like a mega identity that bundles together all of these other identities so that the other side is just so far away from you in so many ways that you just can't, they become an enemy. And you just can't see giving them anything, essentially. And, and that, in turn, is going to make you know, a, an official like Trump, who ends up being very tied to the, a lot of those identities, you know, a very strong object of identification. For some people, he is their hero. For others, he's their enemy. And it, there's just no information that's likely to change that. Uh, and then alongside this, this gets reinforced by the fact that Partisans now live in information universes that promote this or make this self-reinforcing. In Watergate, everybody, if you wanted to see what's going on, you watched ABC, CBS, or NBC Nightly News, and you got the same news from all of those stations. Now, if you watch Fox News uh, and you watch MSNBC, this impeachment drama looks entire, you know, it's like the worlds are upside down, right? And so that's going to allow voters to stay in that protected sense of identity. And then the crucial thing is this then shapes the politician's incentives, right? If you're a Republican politician and you know that 88% of your voters approve of the president, right, and they're not going to change their mind, not likely to change your, their mind, you're going to have a strong incentive to toe the line. But then it also feeds back to voters. If all voters see are party, politicians lining up on party lines, they're not, they have no incentive to update. There's no way they're going to update. And again, voters get the message, this is just partisanship as usual, even when it's not necessarily partisanship as usual. All right. So I want to wrap up my comments by asking, thinking about well, where does this leave the Madisonian system, right? So it sounds, you know, partisanship, it's been with us for a long time. But when it becomes this kind of a force and it overrides institutional motives, it, it leads to the question of whether impeachment can actually work as a check on presidential power in this highly polarized era, right? So in other words, if we have an impeachment and the outcome, as everybody tells us, is essentially preordained, the House will vote to impeach. Seems almost certain, you know, unless video emerges, and even in that case of Donald Trump shooting people on Fifth Avenue, the Senate will, will acquit. Where does that leave impeachment as a tool? Right? And, it, and I think it raises the question uh, that a lot of people are wrestling with. If, if one believes that serious abuses of power have taken place, then is it to better institutionally in terms of our democratic resilience to try impeachment and have it fail in the sense of removal? Right? Is that better because you're at least showing, OK, this conduct is unex you know, has crossed a line where we're going to vote to impeach? right? Is that better, or does it actually, or does the acquittal and the expectation of a, an acquittal just kind of routinize the process and make it less meaningful? In other words, does it make it, well, the next president, when it's a Democrat, will expect Republicans to, to find some reason to impeach that president, regardless, you know, um, and, and it'll play through the same drama, and we lose the ability to distinguish real abuses of power from, from made up ones, right? So I think it's a really tough question as to how do you make this tool viable in this very different era. 
And I think a lot of folks have thought about it from a strategic perspective. Katie was raising the question, well, for Democrats, is this going to help them or hurt them? And maybe it hurts them in these Senate races. Maybe it's a wash in the presidential race. And I think her analysis sounds, sounds exactly right. There's also the question, though, for our democratic institutions, like, which is the better option? And I think that is a deep, difficult question. I don't think political scientists have great answers for it yet. But I think it's really what's facing us now as we think about our institutions. And then finally, I just maybe leave you with a slightly more optimistic note, which is, OK, well, institutions are one check that may well be breaking down. Another check, the last one, uh, is elections, right? And so um, in the end, bad behavior can be addressed at the ballot box. And that's, you know, in, if going back to the founding, that was, you know, the hope was, I think the way they thought of it was um, that elections would be the usual check and institutions are the fallback when all else fails. I think now it may well be reversed where institutions may well be failing, but elections are what might ultimately hold individuals accountable. Thank you. I um, want to again invite the audience to um, write down your questions and send them to the aisle so that we can bring your voices into this conversation. Uh, but I'll just start things off um, by mentioning there was in fact some breaking news today, which is that the um, House Judiciary Committee's Democratic majority released two proposed articles of impeachment. One charges abuse of power, that Trump used his office and the powers of the presidency for, quote, corrupt purposes in pursuit of personal political benefit, unquote. And then the other charge uh, was uh, that Trump obstru uh, obstructed Congress for, quote, directing the unprecedented categorical and indiscriminate defiance of subpoenas, unquote, uh, that were issued by the House and also directing executive branch officials not to cooperate with the impeachment inquiry. So we have two articles of impeachment that um, are likely to move forward. These seem to be narrower than what some political observers were expecting, were perhaps hoping for. And so I guess I, a question for you is in terms of both strategic and institution, through, the, through a strategic as well as an institutional lens, was it wise to go with this narrower focus rather than including, for example, obstruction of justice stemming from the Russia investigation outlined in the Mueller report? Um, and do you think that these charges and the accompanying claims now, I mean, it's really concrete. Impeachment isn't just a single word, but now we know what impeachment means here these, through these two articles. Um, there's additional text in these articles. It's a nine-page document. You can download it if you, if you haven't already. You can read these, um, these articles. But they claim that, quote, President Trump used the powers of the presidency in a manner that compromised the national security of the United States and undermined the integrity of the United States democratic process, unquote, and that he will, quote, remain a threat to national security and the Constitution if allowed to remain in office, unquote. These seem different from, let's say, the Nixon era or the Clinton era. And so will, um, I guess the question is, will, will this resonate um, with American voters, especially the independent voters that have been mentioned so frequently in all of your presentations, the swing voters who will likely um, decide the next election. So I guess there are two questions there. Um, one is about the wisdom of the narrower focus, both strategically and in terms of our institution um, and the responsibility of impeachment. And then um, public opinion. Is this what's going to get uh, independents and swing voters interested, this, uh, this type of charge, this language? Well, I guess I'll start it off. Um, I don't think we should expect changes in public opinion. I, I'm just conditioned by our mm -hmm. polls to date. I kind of look at the world through a rear view mirror. I always tell people I take a poll mm -hmm. and I can see what just happened. <laughs> uh, I can't really look around the corner with mm -hmm. the poll until I do the next poll, but I guess I'm not expecting mm -hmm. much movement. Uh, the narrower perspective you know, might go to the argument that 
uh, many Republicans have been making, which is this thing is just a continuation of this year-long, two-year-long uh, investigation of the president on so many different, you know, starting with Mueller. But that I don't have data for, so I'll hold, stop it there. Well, the one, uh, the one movement we saw was in the national polls for impeachment. It went from about 43, 44 to about 51, right when the whistleblower report came out, that, that sort of week, two weeks. And that is the movement that I think we will see. And those were independents moving towards an, uh, support for an impeachment inquiry. Um, and, uh, and I don't think we're going to see uh, any real movement past that point. I do think, but I think that's the reason that the articles were drawn so narrowly. Uh, it was clear that the Mueller report landed with a thud, um, and then a bunch of mud was thrown on top of it by Bill Barr and his um, uh, version of what the Mueller report said, which as we now know is completely inaccurate. But because he, just to go down this bunny trail for a second, because Barr hijacked the narrative around the Mueller report and what it said, it, you know, uh, it, was, it was too late once that 10 days passed uh, to actually communicate to the American electorate what truly was in the Mueller report. So no, no numbers moved. Uh, people checked out. I also think they're so, the electorate was so over the 2016 election um, that they really wanted to just be an ostrich and, and, and put their heads in the sand uh, when it came to 2016. So, so then in real time, while he was president, uh, the, these violations occurred. And I think that is what moved those numbers from 43 or 45 to 51 among independents. Republicans have stayed the same. Democrats have stayed the same. And is that me? Am I, I doing that? So. Um, and uh, what's happening? Um, and uh, so I think so. That is ultimately the reason I think that they that they so narrowly um, tailored these articles of impeachment around something that he actually has done as as president. I think the only thing I'd add about the, I think that the idea of keeping them narrow is in part with the trial in mind. And, and I think one of the things about the Trump experience has been there's been this succession of scandal and after scandal, story after story, and one tends to wash out the, you know, or block out the next. Or, and, and, and I think the Democrats' theory is that by focusing narrowly on the Ukraine case, that that'll at least get folks to have a deep understanding of this one particular thing and that maybe that will be a little cleaner than trying to talk about multiple topics. I mean, whether it'll work or not, I, is, you know, it's hard to know. But. Okay. okay. Um, while I wait to get the questions, I'll ask one more. Um, so there was a little more breaking news today, which is that um, the House Judiciary Committee could possibly vote on articles of impeachment as early as Thursday. Uh, followed by a vote in the full house expected early next week. And so this may seem like a, a naive question, but why the rush? Um, especially given what, what you've laid out in terms of the importance of, of Congress utilizing its power, uh, its constitutional power to launch an impeachment inquiry. I, I'm, I'm wondering why the Democratic House leadership um, is rushing this because as soon as the impeachment vote happens, then it moves to the Senate and then the Republicans control the process. And then Mitch McConnell gets to decide what the timeline is and gets to decide who's, who's gonna be issued a subpoena and who's not and if we're gonna bring Joe Biden in or if we're gonna bring Hunter Biden in or others. And so I'm just wondering um, why not take more time to gather evidence um, begin deliberations in the House Judiciary Committee maybe after um, Congress returns after the break and then hold a vote maybe later in February after the Democratic nomination process has has gotten off the ground and, and many House filing deadlines have also been passed like what is the benefit of moving quickly to a vote and then turning the process over to to Mitch McConnell who can drag it out for as long as he wants. So, I, I mean, I would say, you know, Speaker Pelosi's had this delegate, delicate managing 
process, you know, within her caucus, where she has a number of members elected, elected from Trump-leaning districts who basically have been very reluctant to, to have to face this issue. And, and what happened in Ukraine, what allowed, and so for a long time, Pelosi, of course, was trying to say, go slow on impeachment, didn't want to move toward impeachment in the first place, and preferred to investigate but not, not go there because she saw it as a hard vote for a number of her members. Uh, I think the Ukraine whistleblower, that sort of essentially forced her hand and also, but also allowed a number of those moderates to say, okay, this is enough. This is the line where we are supportive. But I think even with that, I think the speaker has viewed this as a hard issue for, her, for some of her members. And so I think her philosophy is to try to get it done. She sort of, I think she herself doesn't believe it's going to result in conviction and therefore uh, her and she worries about exactly the dynamics Katie talked about, about it helping mobilize the other side. So I think she feels like she has an institutional responsibility to do this, to defend the power of Congress, a partisan, but also partisan responsibilities to balance what her, many of her members most want her to do this, but also those who are reluctant. And so I think she's continuing to, you know, we can second guess those judgments, but I think that's the calculus that's driving it. Yeah, I, I agree. Okay, great. Okay, here's a question. Um, please discuss the impact of party asymmetry on impeachment and democratic resilience. It might be one for you, Eric. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay, sure. So I mean, there's I would a like a definition of terms. Okay, so party, <laughs> party asymmetry. Please. So asymmetry is the idea that Republicans have basically either move further to the right than Democrats to the left. So polarization is not symmetric in that sense. Also, though, that Republicans have tended to be um, more um, willing to play hardball institutionally. So, for example, things like the Merrick Garland Supreme Court case, uh, things like the voter ID laws that have been passed. So then the question is, how's that playing out? And I think that, that it actually, I think that raises like one of the hardest questions, um, which, is, which is the following. If it's the case that one party has um, adopted a, a stance in which they're willing to go to bat for a president who's done things that in the past were just beyond the pale for either party and, and is willing to make arguments that the House members have been making that are just, you know, seem like the concern for the truth value of the statements is basically z close to zero or zero. So if you're in that world, so the question is, what's the right response for the other party? What's the best response? And there are a lot of political scientists who'd been writing things about the importance of norms that basically say, if norms are eroding in democracy and one party is violating norms, it's gonna be worse if the other party does it too because then that creates a vicious cycle, right? So for example, Republicans you know, deny Garland, so what Democrats should do is pack the Supreme Court mm -hmm. when they get the majority. Mm -hmm. So that's one, and so th this argument is like, well, if Democrats do that, Republicans will do something even more the next time and it'll just devolve, right? And so that's, that's the cautionary side. The, the flip side, though, is if one side is playing by one set of rules and the other side basically, you know, sort of refuses to, you know, tries to abide by the old sets of norms, right, that might be, you know, that may not work as well either, right, because you're basically almost like unilaterally disarming in a sense. And so, so I, think that's a, I think that is really the hard question. I actually was... Uh, you know, talking to, I was at a conference on the future of liberal democracy and, and the line I was pushing is the thing we really don't understand is, is what does a party do? Everybody's focused on the Republicans, right? A lot of people are focused, what's gone on with the Republican party? But I actually think the deeper question now or bigger, you know, is what do the Democrats do in response to that? And I, I don't think we have great answers yet for that. Here's another one. Many people voted for Trump to shake things up, but not to have a scandal-ridden cabinet and use his office for his personal benefit. Why isn't this resonating with Republicans? Well, um, I don't think there's a difference. I think, they, I think the people who voted for him and are loyal to him, um, look, they think all politicians are liars and cheats and feather their own nests. That's what th this portion of the electorate thinks. Trump is better than most politicians because he does it in the open. He does it with glee in their minds, right? He's not, he's not lying about doing it. 
He's just doing it. And so when they sent him there to shake things up, I think they were like, yeah, I know what we're going to get, but at least he's like right out there about who he is and what he's going to do. And, um, you know, for other people, that's horrifying. Whether you're an institutionalist, whether you're a partisan Democrat, whether you're an independent who believes, you know, that democracy is something that's actually worth uh, saving, uh, uh, preserving. Um, but for the folks who are, you know, wearing the Make America Great, again, hats, soon to be, I guess, Keep America Great hats, um, <laughs> that's what they voted for and that's what they wanted. And so I have to say, look, a lot of that's on us, meaning those of us who have been in the, in the democratic establishment, who made promises, who, who elected officials who made promises about yes, you can keep your own doctor when we completely reform the healthcare system, right? I mean, you know, we uh, on the Democratic side have um, uh, have played a role in um, in the voters losing trust in politicians and institutions, and we have to own up to it, um, and 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 we have to figure out what to do about it. So it's not one-sided, um, but uh, you know, all of it has sort of led up to, to where we are now. now. Let me just add a, a couple things. Um, Trump clearly won by making 2016 a, an election about change. You may not like the change, but that is really, it became an election about change. And so as we look at 2020, is it going to be an election about change? Um, that's a fundamental question, and it really, I think, is going to boil down to who the Democrats are going to choose for president. Uh, because I think some of the candidates can make the argument to make it a change election a lot stronger than other candidates. And maybe that's not the winning formula. I'm not trying to advocate necessarily for the change candidate, but it really is going to boil down to the candidate that they choose as to what the tone of the campaign will be. Will it be incremental change or return to normalcy, or will it be a change election, which is what Trump promised and is going to now have to defend? OK. Um, here's one for all of you. There was an influence campaign in 2016 to discredit Hillary Clinton by fabricating an issue with her emails. Why do you think voters were influenced by disinformation then but not influenced by Trump's behavior now. Well, <laughs> I think I dispute the premise of the question. Um, uh, well, I mean, I think, so let me just speak about the disinformation campaign in 2016. Um, we should expect that there will be an equally uh, strong disinformation campaign in 2020, if not stronger. We should expect there will be multiple foreign actors, not just Russia. Uh, we should expect that it's already going on right now. Um, we should be very, very concerned about our election security. We should be very concerned about the security of the voting machines. Uh, we should be very concerned that there has been no money allocated to upgrade our voting system since 2016. We should be very concerned. So when Eric says, elections can be the ultimate check. Really? Right. When we know that what Vladimir Putin wants to do is to inject so much chaos into our liberal democratic system that we no longer believe in it or rely on any institutions, that is what he's doing, uh, including raising doubts about our election security. Um, so there was an article from last November, that is a month ago, about a county in Pennsylvania, I believe it was outside of Philadelphia, do any of the political scientists know about this in the room, that had a, a massive voting machine malfunction. And the only way that it was rectified was because they bought, these were new voting machines, so it's a good news, bad news scenario. Good news, or well, bad news, new voting machines completely broke down um, and, and spewed out wrong results. 
Good news is there was a paper ballot so they could do an audit uh, and, and make sure the voting was correct. So, um, so that happened in 2019 in one county in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, by the way, is a swing state in the presidential election, let's not forget. And let's also not forget that it, were it not for 77,000 electoral votes between Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, there would be a different person in the Oval Office right now. So this is extraordinarily important. And the combination of the disinformation campaign and the threats to election security should make all of us very, very, very nervous about what we're facing for 2020. Okay. Um, we're Yay. running out of time, but let me ask one more. In your opinion, is there any eventual outcome from this whole process that will be positive overall for Democrats? But <laughs> I'm gonna broaden this to for, for our country, yeah, yeah. for That's our a question. populace, for our institutions. We wanna end on a positive note. Anything, please. <laughs> Well, I, I think if the Democrats can frame their case, and this goes to the narrowing of the articles of impeachment, that they're really just trying to uh, do it, the historical right thing to do. Uh, I think that's the position Nancy Pelosi seems to be saying in her talks. Uh, this is beyond partisanship. It's beyond, uh, you know, it, it goes to the heart of our democracy. It goes to the heart of the institution of the Congress. I think if they can hold that line and convince that that's the stance we're taking with these articles moving forward. We're defending the institution. We have to do this. We were forced to do this. And I think that's their strongest case. So uh, I'm trying to be optimistic. Um, well, I would say two optimistic things. Um, one is we should, we should take uh, great uh, comfort um, in what we saw in the 2018 cycle, which was immense activism um, by people who were never active before. And those folks are still active and will remain active. And, um, and so, to the, so, so to me, that means the system's working. Uh, they're, the, the, they're, our democracy is, is supposed to be a people-powered democracy, not to you know, use an election tagline. That, that is actually true. Um, with certain caveats, of course. Um, and, but um, so, so that happened, and, and I think that will continue to happen, so that's good. And the fact that there is an impeachment process happening also says to me the system's working per Eric's slides, right? This is, they, all the checks that Congress can use on the executive have been put into play. The legislative check isn't really working because the Senate isn't complying with the House, so that, that's off the table. The investigation check is definitely happening, and now the impeachment check is happening. And then ultimately, as, as I just referenced, you know, we, we hope that the elections check uh, can, can happen with integrity, uh, that the elections can happen with integrity so that there is or is not, whatever the results are, um, but that they go off in such a way that, uh, that, that, that there is a, you can say that the, the, there's integrity to the process and, and the process is working. Okay. Yes, I have two, one micro optimistic note and then one macro. So the micro one is like we shouldn't, while it seems, while it's pretty clear cut that the Senate outcome's not going to be to convict the president, we shouldn't let off the hook entirely that the handful of Republicans like a Mitt Romney, like a Susan Collins, mm -hmm. who at least potentially Lisa Murkowski, who one could at least envision circumstances um, um, under which those individuals would vote to convict. Mm -hmm. And in the long run, the message sent by, even if it's just a handful of Republicans voting, mm -hmm. is a different one than if, it's, than if it's purely partisan. So I think that's one mm -hmm. point. And then the macro point is, one reason our politics are so intensely polarized is the stakes are really big. And there are a lot, and the reason Republicans, many Republicans, are as committed to the president as they are is a view of a changing country that many people find frightening, but others find very promising. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be an organizational fight, right, in terms of mobilizing people along Katie's line. It's going to determine, the outcome of that is open-ended and is going to ultimately be, hopefully, at least a matter of demographics, mobilization, mm -hmm. persuasion of young people and engagement. 
And so that's not, that history clearly has not been written and it's gonna be up to a lot of folks to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Eric, for sharing your wisdom and expertise with us. And thank you for all of you for joining us for your questions, and we hope to see you at future events.